Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Hello, and thank you for being here. Today, I have a guest who has a story that I wish was not true. I wish we didn't need to share, and I wish that she didn't have to experience. Christina Pierce, a mother from Boston, Massachusetts, joins me to discuss her current court battle that she has been sharing on Instagram, on TikTok, and some very reputable professionals have also been sharing. Christina is a mother, single mother, who went through a high conflict divorce. She is not divorced yet, who lost parental rights because she reported that her daughter was reporting abuse. It is way more complex than I just made that out to be, but you will hear it in Christina's words on this episode. This case is still open and there will be a lot of future updates on it. The best way to stay updated is to follow Christina. All of the links to find her are in the show notes. So just scroll down, click them. She does share them at the end of the episode, but I imagine that you will listen to this in parts and you will likely want to go back to it. If you need help, if you are listening to this and you're struggling, if you are afraid, there are places where you can go. If you contact me and if I have a resource that's not myself. I will put you in contact with them. I do help women with high conflict divorce cases. I'm trained by Tina Swithin and One Mom's Battle. I went through, I believe, the second high conflict divorce coaching training. In addition, I am a trauma-informed coach. I'm also, I've been a life coach since, geez, 2009. I got recertified in 2015 through another resource and stopped working full-time jobs and made coaching my full-time business when I had my daughter. So I've been in this world. I've been in this life for a while. If I don't feel like I'm the best person for you, I will help you find the best person. And I encourage you to go to onemomsbattle.com if you would like to learn more about post-separation abuse. I'm almost at a loss of words. That long pause wasn't planned. I'm reflecting on this episode that you are about to listen to and my heart just breaks for her. My heart breaks for her children and my heart breaks for everybody else that I've been in contact with over the years that have similar stories and As heavy as all of this is, I want to share that I have seen others and I have myself successfully helped women bar against pseudoscience claims. Now, you know what I'm talking about, (laughs) most likely. If you don't, it's the term alienation. It's a pseudoscience. It was literally created by a psychologist that was that committed, not only committed suicide, but he was a pedophile. If you Google it, you'll find all this information. It is literally a pseudoscience and there is a large industry that depends on it being framed as not a pseudoscience. It is the only like psychological disorder that a court will rule on. It's insane. I will not give more words to it. That's how insane it is. There are other episodes where I talked about it more in detail with Tina Swithin. But if you feel, if you are worried, if you are concerned that your case may have some threads of this pseudoscience, prepare now, prepare before you need to be prepared. And if you need help, I am happy to help. I help women with this. I help people with this. I've helped dads with this. And if I'm not the right person for you, I know that there's someone that is. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to send you to the episode. As always, if you'd like to contact me, Email is jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com. Emotionalabusecoach.com is my website. High-conflictdivorcecoach.com is my 
divorce coaching that you can also get to from my main website. You can follow me on Instagram at emotional abuse coach. Here's Christina. Hi, Christina. Thank you so much for joining me today to share your story. Thank you uh, for having me and thank you for providing a platform on topics such as this. Absolutely. Well, and I was thinking about when I reached out to you and then are we connected on a, fa- a local Facebook group? And when I was thinking about this, I always say like, I'm excited to finally talk to you. But like in this case, before we got started, I was just thinking like, I wish she didn't have to do this. Like I really cannot imagine. Yeah. Everyone I meet, I'm like, it's great to meet you, but I wish I never did in the sense that I wish it was under better circumstances. Yeah. I wish this was like a different pot. Like I wish we were talking about being single mommies because I know that's your handle on Instagram. I wish that was our topic today, but it's not. So Christina. So here we are. (laughs) Here we are. And if you can, I'm going to let you just introduce you. And from there, we'll go into a bit more of the background. Sounds good. My name is Christina Pierce. I am a single mother living in Boston. I am still married and have been dealing with the probate court system, or I should say my divorce one way or another since March 14th of 2020, coincidentally the same day that quarantine started. Mm -hmm. I have two children. They are my everything. We spend our weekends hiking, skiing, going to the beach, going to our pool club. You know, our friends will joke, how does she do all that as a single mom? And on January 4th, of this year, I was tragically stripped of physical and legal custody of my children and have not really, I haven't had any ability. I've seen them at a school performance just recently, but other than that, I haven't seen my children since I dropped them off to school and never saw them again. Yeah, which we hear of these stories and especially people that are, you know, follow one mom's battle, follow custody piece. There's all these places that talk about these issues and when we hear about them, they're typically in like other counties. And I've certainly heard of them happening in Boston, Massachusetts. But I think it you're, what you're going through and for the fact that it happened in such a town that like is supposed to be progressive and is supposed to be liberal and very people focused that this happened here. Yeah, I think that that feels shocking to me. It feels shocking to a lot of people. And, you know, I've been left with saying, like, what is this, the 1920s? And how is this happening in Boston? That's exactly the thoughts that have crossed the minds of many. Yeah. So I wanted to start with a little bit of history because I figured without the context, knowing me, I would just jump right in and start speaking about these things and we'd have to backtrack. So I wanted to start with history of how things got here. So you said the divorce started the day quarantine started. So the date you gave me was March 14th, 2020. Is that the date that one of you, you or your husband filed? No, that is the date that we landed from family vacation in the Bahamas and the cat sitter had left the mail. And for whatever reason, I picked up the mail as he was wheeling in the luggage and discovered bank account information, which he had opened up a new account and transferred out 100% of our joint funds. Wow. Okay. So this doesn't start with a filing of divorce. This starts with you being completely blindsided. 100%. Okay. So let's start there. So you land after a vacation in the Bahamas. You come back to what is about to be quarantine time. The news is going crazy. Back to what I describe as a ghost town. It reminded me out of a scene from a zombie movie. Yeah. Yeah. So then you find this information. All the finances have been taken. They've been transferred to another account. What's your reaction? At first, kind of disbelief, I said, well, put it back. And he said, no, I'm leaving. And I said, that's financial abuse. And he said, that's a strong word. And I said, it is. But at that moment, like a bomb went off in my home. I was living under the marriage that at that point I had had for 12 years. I was like, wait, what? Like, are we going to counseling? Like, are we getting divorced? Like, what is going on? Like, we've got kids. You know, it was, I was going into damage control. I wasn't thinking rationally or clearly in the sense that I was just going into damage control. And it was just literally a bomb that had gone off in the home and overshadowed. You know, everyone was kind of anxious and freaking out about COVID. For me, it was hard to look across the street at Mm -hmm. the fire when a bomb just went off in my own home. Yeah. Did you have the sense that this was coming? No. He would have episodes every three to four months. And he had had an episode relatively recently um, triggered by we were in the middle of purchasing our rental. That 
was, for lack of better words, kind of textbook. However, it was something that he had newly gone into therapy to work on. And I was putting a lot of weight in the basket of he was working on these things in this episode. So the episodes weren't necessarily uncommon. They were problematic and they were something that needed to be dealt with. But this, no, and never in a million years would I have thought that this would happen. No one saw it coming and it blew our close family friends out of the water. Like some of them we had just vacationed with in February. Got it. Wow. Well, and like the episodes, were these more of like, was it more mental health related? Like he'd sort of freak out and like try and like flee or was it, and I mean, obviously that this is a personal answer, then feel free, just move past it. But, or was it more like a depressed episode where he wasn't fully functioning? They were always kind of the same. I just never knew what triggered them. And I would spend my time trying to figure out what triggered them. I remember one time he was coming home from a business trip and I was like rapidly cleaning the home. And our nanny at the time was like, is everything okay here? She got the vibe, like in other words, if the house wasn't going to be clean, I might be hit. And that wasn't the circumstance, but I was behaving in a way that she even said something verbally to me. So I didn't know what the triggers were. So I would just try to eliminate them and hope that it didn't trigger one. But it would be like withdraw, withdraw, acting maybe like you're mad at me or just withdrawn, short answers. Are you okay? Yep. What's wrong? You seem like everything. Nope. Fine. Withdraw, withdraw, withdraw. And then are you sure? Are you sure? And then, you know, I would poke the bear. But I also came to learn that if you elongated poking the bear, it just dragged out the withdrawal. So it was kind of like at some point the the bandaid had to be torn off and then the explosion came. Mm -hmm. Everything was my fault. I was working against him and the sky, you know, was purple, you know, just things that were completely different than would be characteristic of the person that I knew yesterday. Let's put it that way. And then they would end. Exactly the cycle of abuse, you know, like tensions are rising. You're trying to bar against them. Then, like you said, you poke the bear to figure out what the hell is going on. There's the explosion. Then the, there's that's the abuse of it, at least the abuse of incident. And then it somehow gets back to a calm again until to yes. rise again. And then one thing I distinctly remember is that the state of confusion where I felt like, I say this figuratively, but I had just been beaten up. And then the person that's there that is there to comfort you, like is the person that just beat you up. And I remember acknowledging And I actually verbalized this to him that it felt like a very conflicting feeling to just need like your husband to hug you and make you feel like better. But that was the person that just did that. And it was a very conflicting, confusing feeling. Yeah. And that's literally the definition of like a trauma bond. You know, that's how it feels to be in a trauma bond is the person that hurt you is also the person that you believe is going to make you feel better. And that I don't think anything feels like crappier than that when it's happening. It's like, it's so confusing. Right. I had no perspective on any of those things. I've equated it to, you know, I've never used illegal drugs. Even in high school, I think we used to be the quote straight edge group. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But I equated it to like being on drugs in the sense or what I would imagine in the sense of like, you couldn't realize it when it was happening. And it was only when it was like out of your system. And when the fog cleared that you could kind of look back and see it. And it took some time after the physical separation of being alone in my own house When things started to come together, people started to make me aware of things. I started to remember things because I wasn't able to look at it objectively when I was too busy kind of like trying to put out the fires and keep my family together. It was hard to see the bigger picture. Yeah. And I'm sure it felt like living in a fog a bit that once you were able to get some physical and mental space from it, then pieces started to come together. But especially when you're dealing with it and they're telling you your perception is wrong, it's hard to see and you're being blamed. It's hard to see outside of it. So after that bomb went off, did you continue to live in the marital home with him for a while? Not with him. No, he left that day. I believe he went into like a hotel and then rented like a fairly expensive Airbnb. And I stayed in our home with the two children. Okay. So very quickly, that sounds like almost immediately, everything changed. Everything. And my daughter, you know, lost. I mean, we all lost, but from a child perspective, it wasn't just her father, it was school. It was friends. We were completely cut off. You know, if let's just say your spouse dies tragically or even not tragically, you know, friends are coming to your house, they're bringing a box of tissues, you know, they're holding you while you cry. No one, this was the start of the pandemic and nobody was coming to my house out of fear that we could literally kill each other. So it was very much 
a horrific experience in itself. Um, it was exact. It was an inhuman experience due to the timing of the world, and it certainly didn't have to happen that way. And the answer could have been at any time. You know, let's table this. This is a pandemic. Like, let's figure out how to, even if it's not living together, but you know, in healthy ways to. Right. Unfortunately, like, let's, let's pause and figure this out. Yeah, like right. my my ex husband and I, we had like three separations before it was like final. I think that was the let's figure out what we want and take some space moment. So like there's so much around that time that's like coming back to me too. Cause like my child was only three at the time when the pandemic started. I remember thinking like her whole world just got turned off and like your child just based off the ages, like she was in, was she she in first grade? She was in kindergarten and she is extremely, extremely social. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I know a lot of, of course, kids like to play with their friends, but that is a with huge source life. of support. Yeah. Friends. It is. Yeah. And More so than other children. Yeah. Same with my kid. Like she severely misses people, you know, like she was the kind of kid that wanted to FaceTime with her friends and right. even at three. My it's- daughter's first question when we're doing something is who's coming with us. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's not because she doesn't want to do it with her brother and me, but her first thought is like, is a friend coming with us? It's her first question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so cute. That's so cute. She like wants to bring everyone along with her. And we do. We've opened our, you know, if we've rented a home for vacation, we've opened our doors. We've always had friends come to visit. We've lived very, we have a lot of friends. Our kids have a lot of friends and we've had a really great, we haven't been isolated for the past few years, which I think has been even more shocking to people. Whereas I am known, my, me as a mother is very well known. And how could something like this happen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. I can see, and I guess before we move on, I don't want to lose this thought. I could see that connection in the pictures that you post. You post one photo a day. I know at the end, you'll share your Instagram handle with everyone, but there are photos of like living life. It's not like, oh, we went out to dinner because that's like, or here's us us all watching TV because we don't do anything. It's like everything you've posted, it shows like the genuine connection that you have. And that was always there. It's not a futile attempt now to look how kids look at how happy my kids are. It's because you see that too. You know, I had a quick anecdote, a story in court where the day before my daughter had actually complained about feeling uncomfortable being forced to take pictures. And she said, it's like, he's trying to make me look like I'm happy. And I actually described the three photos in detail the day before court. And what do you think materialized? I must be psychic, but you know, that's, yeah, that's a challenge. If only you could identify trauma or abuse by just looking around and seeing who smiles in a photo. If that were how it works, you know, the world's problems would be solved. Yeah. You know, as mothers, we know when our kid is giving a fake smile or a forced smile and what a genuine smile looks like. Yeah. Okay. So March 14, 2020 happens. He moves out to a hotel, then Airbnb. Are you still cut off from money? No, at that point, I'm not cut off from money. At that point, we were both utilizing the shared account and his family, I believe, was subsidizing his new way of living. That said, I was a business owner at the time, which hit a troubling spot. Yeah, so. Yeah, unless you were like figuring out how to cure COVID. Almost everybody had that, like, it's like the world stopped. I mean, that's what I- 100%. Like you were in the spot of everything stopped. Did you start, I know courts were closed, which is like an important piece of this puzzle at this time. So nothing could get done, you know, and then when court started, it was Zoom court. But I'm curious, were you able to come up with a parenting plan at this time? Yes and no. There were obviously safety concerns with who was coming in and out of his home. It was a temporary home. We were prior working with a, prior to separation, we were working with a therapist specifically for people that have issues parenting their children. Okay. And so we were previously working with someone because of his challenges with our daughter and some of those explosive episodes. So, you know, (laughs) this predated separation, you know, this is not, you know, yeah. And I think she also came in as guidance unofficially, but officially, I mean, I know we were paying her, we were paying her. I don't know if she was taking money from me because I think she felt so bad, but Mm -hmm. so at first I would leave and he would come do parenting in our home. And she said that that was like re-traumatic because, you know, then he would leave again. 
Mm-hmm. And so, you know, my daughter had a lot of anger at the time. And, you know, there were some concerning incident or two that happened between him and the children very early on. At one point, I had to like bang on the door to get my daughter out and make him leave the home. Yeah. So we were receiving some guidance on that. And then we first didn't go into court. We first started with mediation. And I want to say that was in 2021. Okay. So once you could begin mediation, you tried that. How did that go? I felt I was hesitant at first. Um, And then we looped in an expert in the field um, named Katie Rice, who is very well known in the state and very well respected. I'm sure that's a name you've heard before. I do know that she's very experienced, that she, you know, used to be a probation officer, that she is not a lawyer, GAL. She's a mental health provider. Anyway, from her investigation, she concluded that it wasn't even in the children's best interest to have two consecutive nights with their father. And she put him on a phased six month plan to build up to what he wanted, which was alternating weekends. And that was going to be step one, step two, and then alternating weekends, which he wanted under the one condition or the one parameter that he really didn't like. And that was that his girlfriend not be around the children. Yeah. Well, but that also makes complete sense. So that just sounds, you know, when we think about children's best interests, which is always what we're supposed to be thinking about, it sounds like simply asking for the girlfriend not to be around him having an issue with that is just like, it's one, not paying attention to the children's best interests and two, just really being selfish and bitter. 100% it was a problem, let's say. I don't know the motivation behind it, but Katie Rice did say to me, I can tell you where I was standing. I burst into tears because it was the first time. I mean, you know, this, this, it wasn't like we had seen many professionals, but it had felt like a long time of, you know, this craziness happening. And then she came in and got it. And so it felt like a sign of relief. And she said he, I don't know, begrudgingly or whatever, he agreed. He didn't like it, but he agreed. What we didn't know at the time is he had already moved her in. Okay. And we didn't know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, from my experience with him, some of the challenges he has had in the past is he'd tell his family one thing, he'd tell me another, you know, it would go up to the last minute and then someone's going to get found out that he's telling two stories to two different people. So I would guess, and I don't know, I would guess that the girlfriend might not even have known that she was supposed to vacate the home. I, I don't know. It would seem more like him if he had this and was like, oh crap, what do I do now? And it, at that point, he was alone five to six nights out of the week. Yeah. So there was ample time to spend those nights with your girlfriend and just focus on the kids when, you know. Yep. But those were some of the early problems. Call her mom, framed photos of the four of them buying a Christmas tree in December of 2020. Things that were very challenging. I remember my daughter stealing one of the photos from the frame and coming home. It was crumpled and she was crying. You know, you don't have to be a genius to know that that was probably a very difficult adjustment for my daughter and and unnecessary. Yeah, especially so, what you said about the five nights, you know, a week, if not more than that, that it just goes back to the priority. And I have to imagine it was framed differently to the woman, but who knows? But I just, yeah, that sounds extremely messy. And also, I'm glad Katie Rice picked up on it, was able to name it and frame it and to put in some of these limitations. I mean, I had handwritten journals, like documenting most things, handwritten from instances and and things. And, you know, and I, I remember what she said to me. She said, I believe there's a problem. And I don't just believe that from talking to you. I believe that from talking to him too. So whatever he was saying was sending off her red flags as well. And that, you know, I think was important for me to hear because it wasn't that she was kind of believing one side versus another. It's that from her experience, she was picking up on red flags from him that also signaled there was a problem. Yeah. And it sounds like, like you said before, you know, that the whole thing about telling one story to one person, one story to another person, a mix of both stories to somebody else, like it's going to end up coming out. Like things are not going to be consistent, you know? And I, I tell this to clients all the time, like, as long as you document, you stay focused on your fat, on the actual truth and what's happening, like they are going to mess up. And at this point, so early on, he's messing up pretty big. Yeah. And I mean, and something I remember my attorney saying at the time, he had met with our mediation judge first and then I met and it wasn't, you know, maybe five minutes into the conversation. I hadn't even gotten into any of my story. 
And I said something about like, I've been concerned. I need a GAL. And she's like, oh, we're going to use Katie Rice. We're going to get a parenting coordinator. And my lawyer after was like, he must have said something that sent off red flags to her to even think that was an issue because I hadn't even communicated with her yet. So at this point, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with finances. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm feeling heard and acknowledged on some serious concerns that exist even at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what I'm hearing from you too, is that at this juncture, you felt like you could speak. And I think you probably had the belief that court professionals are here to help. 100%. That was 100% what I saw and thought at that time. So take us from post Katie Rice, not to today, because I'm sure a lot happens and you eventually end up living separately and having a plan, I'm guessing. But after Katie Rice, what happened after that? We began the plan. Mm -hmm. Um, which was documented in email and text messages. I know he's now refused that that plan ever existed. However, there's emails and texts. We began that plan and it was quickly violated. And the girlfriend was clearly around the kids. He was never really able to brush my son's hair and he was coming in in these neat little buns. And I remember saying, oh, your hair looks so nice. Who did your hair? And he's like, I don't know if I should say her name, so I won't. He'd be like, her. I don't know. Let's just call her Jane. Jane did it. So, and I was like, oh, you saw Jane? And my daughter would say, no, he didn't. Nope. Nope. She wasn't there. And I was like, it's okay. Like, let him share his experience. And she's like, but he's lying. It's not true. And then he would say something and she'd be like, well, maybe she was the, and, and it was just very concerning at that point. However, that for, you know, lawyers is all like document, 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 like we'll use that later. You know what I mean? But it didn't interfere with the plan, particularly, even though he was violating it. In essence, because we were also told that if plan part one wasn't followed, then it didn't automatically start part two. So there were supposed to be check-ins before the phases started. So, you know, this was just, let's see how it goes. So then my daughter started missing school and she was sick. She had stomach aches. Now keep in mind, this is very early pandemic and those are signs of COVID that you're supposed to keep somebody home. Yeah. And so I remember one day, it was a Friday and she said to me, I wish I went to school yesterday so I could stay home today because I'm going to see dad or something. It was one of those days. And that's when I realized she wasn't sick. This was emotional. Yeah. And that's when I had a, another conversation and they said, you need to pull the weekday visit. And I did. I pulled the weekday overnight because it was impacting the school week. And I said, we need to get back on the plan. And once we do, we will re-implement that. And he got very angry and ran into court and filed for 50-50. And at this point, that's one of the first filings. So he, that was the first filing. Okay. Was it an emergency order or temporary orders? I think that was his first official filing in court. I, I'm not, and again, the technicalities of how it works. Yeah. I know that was the first thing aside from filing for divorce. Like that was the first yeah. okay, that time was I was aware that we would see a judge, if that makes sense. Got it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you go to court and right before we started recording, you and I were chatting briefly about the judges because as we get to the story, which we are close to, like, and the things that are happening now, and there's an important part of that you had a different judge that had a different tone, had a different perspective. 100%. And so now you're with that judge, right? And I'm, so you have this plan by a very reputable GAL that put this together and there's a step-by-step, he's not following the steps. Correct. The children are presenting issues you know, your daughter and well, and your son sort of being like coached into lying it rather than just being honest, like you probably could deal with the truth and work with the truth as long as he, you're not watching your kid have to lie. Well, 100%. And that was the issue. My daughter would report like getting yelled at for walking into the bathroom because she can't walk into rooms without asking permission because obviously somebody was being concealed or she reported hearing coughing and she'd ask her father who's coughing and he'd say, I don't hear any coughing which I don't know if anyone's actually seen the movie about gaslighting back in the 50s or whatever, but that's the definition. It's denying something. You know, she saw flickering gaslights and she's like, why are they flickering? He's like, they're not flickering. So yes, it did become very problematic to the children. Yeah. More so my daughter. How did that first hearing go? The hearing for temporary orders? The very first thing she did was tell him that she's never seen any benefit from having an independent third party, no girlfriend around the children. She ordered alternating weekends and she, and then she ultimately ordered like support and things like that. Um, she also ordered that he would pay tuition 
and things like that. So she had protective orders in place for the kids. And similarly, the girlfriend would now have to vacate the home. And again, no one had stated that they had moved in already. I know that now, but he had never stated to me that she was moving in when that had originally happened. I do know that he, on the record, moved in with her maybe a month after that order came out. And that's when they moved from Boston to the suburbs. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So at this juncture, it still sounds like I trust the court process. You know, when I tell, it sounds like when I tell the truth and what's happening and how the kids are presenting, they hear me. Correct. Yeah. And that's when the motions would start coming in. There would be a motion to get the girlfriend back in the house that should say no. There would be a motion that I was an extreme alcoholic and couldn't even stand up, that I would come to pick up the kids and they would stand on the sidewalk and watch me attempt to parallel park and I'd be slurring. I mean, it wasn't comical because it was costing me thousands of dollars and it was horrifying, but it almost was comical in the sense of, well, then why'd you put the kids in the car? Like if you're making that claim, Mm -hmm. so then are you negligent? Like, which is it? And then came the claim that the kids were neglected. They were dirty. They were smelly. There were were holes in their clothes. They're malnourished. Basically, you know, they look like when you find some kids in like a a basement cage, you know, in one of those horrific news stories. Yet like my kids are in private school, going to private summer camps, like skiing on the weekends, like no one's ever seen that. So she never used to even hold those motions. She would just strike them out. And I've come to learn that that is actually illegal in Massachusetts though abusive litigation is not illegal, frivolous motions are illegal. Um, And that's what she was protecting and doing her job at the time. Okay, so it was illegal for her to strike them? No, it was illegal to file frivolous motions without any substance. That is against the law to harass the other party by filing those. So she would adhere to the law where there was no evidence. There was never any substance provided to back up the claims. So I never, we never even went to court with those crazy claims is my point. Got the it, judge yeah. was doing her job. Exactly. Exactly. The judge was doing her job. Right. Yeah. Because even when you said them, it's like, that's insanity. I mean, and I've seen insanity. That is insanity. And I'm glad that you have never had a DUI. I mean, I joked at the time, I challenge anybody to even find a friend that's even ever seen me drunk, mm-hmm. you know, in, in many years. I mean, and um, it's also like, well, how are the kids doing? Right. Like, it's like, if you look at the right. records, right, people know you, like, I'm sure you could have had. 40 people right off the David that said like, she's a, like, I see her here. She's a great mom. Right. I mean, yeah. doctors do toxicity for, you know, the generic depression medication. Like no one's ever seen any evidence of this. And in addition, no one's ever shown evidence of it being accurate. So it really was concerning to me, but it still cost thousands of dollars in legal bills, even though we weren't going into court. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. still dealing with it with my lawyer. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, even when it doesn't go to court, it's absolutely still post-separation legal abuse because it is, like you said, it's costing you all this money. You have to defend it. You also have to explain it to your lawyer. Then your lawyer wants to strategize around it and how to show patterns. And now you're documenting the patterns. It becomes a full-time job. 100%. And that attention that should be given to children and, and so much attention is placed on the mother of, oh, shield them from the court. And I dare somebody to do it better. But at the same time, when, you know, so much effort is spent trying to bat at the baseballs being thrown at you, you know, that is deterring some time from being a bet. Not that I'm not a good parent, but that by default, you only have so many hours in a day. Mm -hmm. And that would, you know, equate to me for late nights after they were in bed, the ability to work out went away because after they were in bed, that's when I'd have to deal with it. There were things that had to go in my life so that it couldn't impact the child, but I could still deal with all these crazy things. Yeah. Like you said, there are only a few hours in the day. And then when the kids, that the kids are out of the house and you have to like, it's like, I'm sure you're working, you know, like there's other things that have to happen too, to keep life moving. Because I always think of legal abuse as like, this is meant to throw us off. This is meant to make us make make mistakes. This is meant to like cost us our sanity. Right. And obviously there's the financial part, but the impact of the mental and like the, all the other stuff, it always feels, and always felt to me so much more than the financial, the financial sucks, but it's like, I, if I could just shut it down and not have to talk about it and put anything together and just pay for it, I'd rather do that because then I don't have to like take this time away. Right. It could be like either sleeping or like putting away our laundry. So when we wake up, 100%, we can go right into, you know, breakfast. 100%. And the accountability needs to be on the person inflicting it. 
mm-hmm. the spotlight isn't on, well, well, how are you managing having all these baseballs thrown at you, which by the way, was pretty damn good. But either way, I was always very concerned at why isn't the attention being, you know, spotlighted on the person doing the quote crazy things. Yeah. With your first judge, do you end up getting to like a separation agreement? No, these were all temporary orders. So we had temporary orders in place for child support. We had temporary orders in place for parenting. There was even, you know, when he started refusing to continue the children's extracurricular activities, um, she had even placed an order that he could not unnecessarily delay or deny activities. An order had to be made to stop feeding my child gluten that she's allergic to. There were lots of orders that needed to be minutially in place that shouldn't have had to continuing her fencing class that she loves yeah, these doesn't, are, shouldn't be a struggle when it, yeah. you know, when it's, you know, it, it just shouldn't be a struggle. So we had to seek the court to help that. And oh, by the way, it just, to this day, it's not being followed. Yep. Okay. It's not funny. It's sad. But I remember a doctor appointment. I said to the doctor, like, can you just put in an email that like, she's really not well enough to travel. Like he's not going to believe me otherwise. And And she was like, I'm not in the middle of your parenting issues. And I was like, no, 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 that's not it. Like, you know, but he like, he hasn't seen her. He doesn't know that she's like this sick. Like, and she goes, she has two ear infections, you know, a sort like strep throat and like listed everything. And she's like, this is a parenting issue. And she wouldn't do it because of just like, she just felt like it was ridiculous, but well, like, right. Because it is ridiculous. How could a parent not see these two ear infections, this, that, and the other? Yeah, exactly. They don't see that. and and. I've experienced that as well in school administrators. I've had to come out to the driveway. The best I could do was tell my daughter, we have to get to school. We can talk to somebody there because I knew if she stayed home, it would just be used against me in a court of law. Mm -hmm. Um, So despite panic attacks, you know, I would get her to school and an administrator would have to come out to try to get her out of the car. And she would verbalize, I don't want to go in. I don't want to see my dad to pick me up. I mean, she would verbalize it in a more upset, panicked way. And I would assure her, So, you know, all that verbally was done. You know, they can hear me saying like, it's going to be fine. I'm going to see the dad for tomorrow. They're hearing all that. And they're also hearing the child say she doesn't want to go with her father. But where's the letter? (laughs) You know, where's that? And I I had sent at one point an email and I was like, thank you so much for today. This is what, you know, just kind of recapping what happened. And I would get an email back being like, yes, you know, she's doing better. You know what I mean? But Mm -hmm. That was also my way of saying, well, here's their opportunity to be like, deny it. You know what I mean? That if they weren't going to do it on their own, yeah, then they were going to have to be in a position to deny it. Because obviously, if that were false, they would say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, that's not what happened. Or you know what I mean? They, they would say something to like legally, you know, to CYO or whatever, or CYA. Right. Um, but that was the best that I could get. Nobody wants to get involved. And that's why I hate when they're like, the school, bro, this. Yeah. Nobody wants to get involved. And they're also never aware of what mud is being slung on the other side. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. And like, on one hand, I think that doctors, schools, professionals, I mean, even like, especially therapists, I mean, and I understand why therapists don't want to get involved. I mean, I don't think I like that my child feels comfortable, you know, with her therapist. I think that's important that like they, she trusts her. But all these professionals, when things are happening, they really try and take that step back. And I think on one side, they're trying to just like be the professional that they are and not get into these things. But then there's like on the other side, though, there's such an impact placed on these things on school, on on like, so it's like it doesn't add up. I also think it comes from a place of CYA and from a therapist perspective, it might come from some therapeutic value. You know, I remember reading or discussing with a clinician, I forget which one or both, about just generally speaking, borderline personality disorder. And they said that it's typically not diagnosed because if they diagnose, like there's not going to be any continuing. I mean, if there's even a borderline seeking treatment, which is a miracle, but providing a diagnosis like that would just discontinue treatment. So in other words, there's more help in not turning someone away. And, you know, my daughter's therapist who did kind of straddle the line, however, would very adamantly put into writing like slow transitions are important for her. But she would say, I'm sure you're both interested in what's best for her. But, you know, she was also aware when I contacted her and he would not agree to therapy. And then once we got into court, finally, all of a sudden he was in fan of therapy, which again, I said to my lawyer, I'm like, this is so annoying, but like, I'll take the win when I can get it. You know, the most important thing is my daughter starting therapy. 
But, you know, she filed a 51A against his house. You know, multiple people have filed abuse reports or suspected abuse reports uh, against his home. And she was one of them. Mm -hmm. And that was based on a privileged conversation. And, And she's been treating my daughter for a long time. So she would know what's genuine, what's not. She, I mean, this wasn't a kid coming and saying, mommy told me not to, you know what I mean? So it's like, I don't even understand how anybody could formulate an argument on the other side because it just defies logic in my opinion, but it happens. Yeah, absolutely. I want to get to the abuse allegations. So let's kind of get to the change in judge because that's when things really probably started to take this different and new. Absolutely. um, So now you speak very publicly about Judge Teixeira in the Suffolk County Court. What year was it when she sort of took over from the previous judge? Yes. And just for the record, One Mom's Battle was the first person that kind of put her out there. There's another advocacy group that kind of put her out there. And from that, I kind of, I guess, felt a little more empowered. I did start a little timid with my story in fear of further retaliation, but I'd already been retaliated against for following the advice of doctors and law enforcement. So I guess insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And by putting it out there, you know, we've identified the nine victims. So just wanted to asterisk, you know, I was still scared at first, but um, yeah. 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 So Judge Teixeira, I guess, was out of Essex County. And though I have not reviewed the medical documents myself, it appears to be well known um, that she sustained, she fell and had a semi- I'm not a clinician, brain injury or something to that effect. And that's again, what, I, that's what's like out there pretty much. Yes, I cannot make those claims. I have not reviewed the medical information, but that is fairly well known in the legal community that that occurred. I can't state the reasoning, but shortly thereafter, she was transferred out of Suffolk. I'm sorry, out of Essex. I believe she might've done a very brief stint in Norfolk and then came into Suffolk County in maybe, I mean, March, April, the the spring of 2023. And that's when everything changed. 2023. So all of this stuff that's happened, I mentioned to you right before I went online, I saw how much has been filed on and then how much awful has also has been taken off. This is only since the spring. And I think that's the other thing that's so wild to everyone is that the kids were protected up until May of 2023. And that's when she reversed everything. And for lack of better words, all hell broke loose, you know, not all at once. But and prior to that, there were complaints prior to that. It wasn't smooth sailing. But in hindsight, it was a dream compared to where we are now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like, (laughs) to be honest, everything you appreciating you're shocked because that's the fact of the matter. I've been, you know, we've been protected for years all of a sudden. Well, I'm more shocked because like being in the family court system, just going on and seeing all the filings. I was like, oh my God, there's so many here. Like you have to scroll down, <laughs> you know, when you're on your case. I mean, I'm well into the multiples of the six digits. I mean, it's insanity how much that could have benefited the children, you know? And when he complains about private school tuition that, you know, he thanked me when I sought out financial aid right before he transferred all our money. If all of our legal bills went into the children's education, I mean, no one would ever have to worry about tuition again. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Everything that yes, everyone that sees it, they're like, it's a complicated docket. And I'm like, oh, yes, it is. No, it's an insane docket. Like, it's like, it's insane. I think one thing or one question that I have on it is until this point, everything that was filed was like pretty, not to say reasonable, but it was like, it's like what we hear about. You know, it's like you're having to nitpick and go for these like little things, like including like making sure that she like your child being fed, which she needs to be fed. But at this point, I believe all of the filings were done by him. I think the counter filings were done by us, but I want to say every complaint was filed by his side. Got it. And then what was the first filing under Judge Teixeira? I don't even know what, or if it was, I never realized, people would say like, what are you accomplishing at this court date? And I'm like, I have no idea. They don't give you an agenda. Like it was never made clear to me. And I don't know if other parents feel this way, but people will be like, what's the point of this date? And I'm like, a status update? Like it, it, I've never really received an answer, but either way we had gone in. And at that point, she made a statement that she had quote, never seen a father with such little time, which is ironic because alternating weekends is not that uncommon. (laughs) No, yeah, it's pretty common. 
Yeah. And either way, she's been a judge for at this point, like a couple years, you know, versus, and that's, you know, when I was speaking to some attorneys, they were like, Katie Rice got it. Judge Kaplan got it. Judge Ward got it. You know, all these people got it. And then in walks this other judge and she's the first person to not get it. Yeah. I mean, and it doesn't stack up. You know what I mean? To use her terms, it doesn't pass the smell test. You know, she said that to me once, but and that was her word. So I, it just doesn't pass the smell test of this being what everybody else was seeing. Yeah. And it also sounds like she wasn't really respecting the prior judge's rulings. Not you know, at all. Building off the prior, like the rulings or the belief that like this stuff has been litigated in uh, front of reputable judges. Reputable people had evaluated this. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. A lot of eyes have been on this and they're all reputable. Like all the names you just mentioned, Katie Rice, Judge Kaplan, like those are all very reputable names in Massachusetts family court. Exactly. And I mean, we did have a jail. The, I mean, the only thing that had come out, we did have a jail report come out from, you know, I'm so happy to see the news articles coming out about William James College because I was aware of, I became aware early in 2023 about the issues at William James College um, and issues with the educational system for the GALs, which is very aligned with, you know, the very concerning claims of what's coming out of William James College. Mm-hmm. And we had agreed to an experienced GAL and got passed to a student. And now we're seeing that you can't even do that. I would have had to appoint William James College as the GAL for them to pass it to a student. When I appointed Susan Smith, to use a false name, I agreed to Susan Smith. I didn't agree to you know, a, again, I don't recall her age. What I do recall is that it wasn't a young woman. So it didn't strike me as a student. This was someone, you know, closer to retirement age than, which again, you can always choose a new career. I'm not shaming, but I wasn't aware that I got a student at the time. I was aware that the name wasn't what I recalled it was getting. Our report was like the second report she ever wrote. There were complaints from even my daughter's therapist whose privileges were protected, yet she badgered her on the phone for 45 minutes, things like that. And then she issued in five days, she started writing a 66 page report to rush it out before the deadline. And it was just very inconsistent. There were holes. My lawyer kind of like objected to it saying like, this is a piece of evidence. This isn't, this was, you know, done poorly. And this is by a student that we didn't agree to. And yeah. that's all a GAL report is, is it's a piece of evidence subject to cross-examination. And there are lawyers out there that have reports from William James College where they forgot to swap names. Wow. Yeah. BC Law was doing a, is doing a white paper on William James. And I was aware of that. And I was like, every month that went by that that white paper didn't come out was frustrating to me because I was just waiting for it to come into the public about William James College as further, you know, we were going to depose the GAL, you know, she was going to get crucified from there. But now that this is out and the article even mentions the white paper still to come out, um, there's a huge issue going on at William James. And I'm really glad it's coming to light because we yeah. paid a lot of money for an experienced GAL and we got like a sham of a program. So yeah, from another yeah, reputable. That, that was the only thing. That's the only thing that's ever come out. And it wasn't even against me, but it made some claims that weren't substantiated. You yeah. know, he talks to the kids about the divorce. He does too, but less. Well, do you have like a checker mark? Like, like, are I you know. there? Like, how do you, how do you even make those claims? <laughs> Yeah, like, is there a nest cam that they're watching? <laughs> right. I'm like, okay. Do you have any evidence of this? Because I, I don't, and you don't. Yeah. It's also, you know, when those claims are made too, like what always sticks out to me is like, well, what does a parent say when the child comes to them with a concern or a question? And like, you know, as a parent, you're trying to answer it like as fairly and not gaslighty, but also not disparaging the other parent. Like you have to go through like in a, in a millisecond yes. steps. You have to walk a tightrope while hula hooping, while juggling. Yes, exactly. Right. And, and you, can't, you don't get to pause yeah. to, to think that up, to think through the answer. Sometimes I'll, when if my daughter comes to me, I'll say, you know, I think that'd be a really good thing to like ask daddy. And sometimes she'll say yep. like, no, you know, she'll say, she'll just like have a way to say no. And I just like, I'm like, okay, well, here's what I think roundabout the answer might be. But if we want, if you want, I can ask No okay. And then we just sort of move on and she tends right. to move on. And I, you know, at one point she'll probably ask, but like, you know, that's something that comes, like I've had a client of mine, her GAO report said that she was too controlling. And I know this mother <laughs> just like yeah. too controlling. And right. I was like, what's the example that they use? She was like, 
well, we're starting to potty train the child. And I didn't agree to get started just yet, like, because my life isn't set up for it. And I said, can we just wait, you know, a month? <laughs> right, exactly. Before we get down this like potty training plan, having to follow and, a kid around peeing on carpets and everything, right? She was like, we just have like travel and my parents are visiting. I just know I can't like give it the 110% that I right. can next month. And I was like, and that's the reason why you're too controlling. And she was like, that's what was cited was that I, I mean, timelines and anything that was cited in ours wasn't even backed up by any evidence. The real comical part is I had never heard the term parentified before. And I thought what it meant when I heard it would mean that the kid prefers one parent, like she's parentified to one parent versus another. What I found is that it means that it has to take on the role of parent and has to take care of their siblings. And that, I mean, you had to laugh because we spend a lot of time, you know, I began spoken to you explaining how social my daughter is. I mean, it's rare that we don't see friends on a weekend. Like it's really rare. We make a lot of plans with friends and everyone will say, I mean, I don't think there's anyone out there that will say that she will do jack for her brother. <laughs> you know, and, and it's a struggle for me. I mean, if I even ask her to like unload the dishwasher, she's like, why do I have to do anything? You know, yeah. I get a lot yeah. of action from her and I have to kind of combat that with, you know, being a parent, you know, some rational discipline while also having empathy to the fact of what she's going through. But being the parent, I would uh, challenge anybody to provide an evidence of that. I would love, love when anybody makes these claims to come forward with examples, because, um, you know, it, it reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever seen the original Miracle on 34th Street, Long time black ago. and white one or whatever. And I want to say, it's like part of how they prove that like Santa Claus is real and they bring in like, bags and bags full of mail, you yeah. know, because obviously the post office is an official organization that it acknowledges Santa's real. And, you know, given the chance, I could flood the court with thousands of things to the contrary. And I would really welcome for the matter of honesty, anybody to provide evidence of the contrary. I would yeah. welcome it. Yeah. And then because if there was evidence, like as a mom, we would edit, we'd be like, oh, there's some truth there. Why don't I change my behavior if there's 100 percent? Yeah. Not. No, there's not. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, God, I've been so afraid of the system. I mean, they would have told me jump and I would have said how high if I were doing it, I would have stopped, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you said something that reminded me about how, you know, you give a little answer and your child said no. I had consulted, quote, experts in this for children to kind of guide my answers. The, the person that I said was working with us for the parenting issues that he was having with our daughter, a psychologist out of my child's pediatrician. And the advice always used to seem to be, just give a little bit of information like, mom, where do babies come from? You know, just an example. And I'd be like, well, it was in my belly. And a child might say, oh, okay. And that's their way of saying like that satisfied their question. That's mm -hmm. enough. You have to be like, whoa, what a man loves a woman. You know, it's like too much information. And then if they're not satisfied, they might say, okay, well, how does the baby get out? You know, and then, then you can take that step by step and yeah. little steps. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that we were always advised, and this was before separation was do not lie. We were combating some issues of lying in the house. And we were told even white lies to correct. So, you know, if we were driving her to school that day and the bus didn't come, it's not, oh, the bus didn't come, you know, because then she's going to go into school and her friend's going to say, hey, why weren't you on the bus? And she's going to say, oh, my dad told me there was no bus. So even those little things we were told to correct. So it's a stern, no lying policy in my home. Mm -hmm. But you can't obviously give the full truth when you're trying to protect them from court and details that you're not supposed to share. So, you know, a go-to of mine you know, why is daddy doing X? Sometimes adults do things that we can't understand. You yeah. know, I would look for answers like that. Somebody might come forward and tell me that's the wrong answer, but I've received that from guidance from several professionals as a way that children should be felt heard, but we don't have to get into it. Cause honestly, I don't know why my daddy might do that. I might have my hypotheses and my opinions, but those don't necessarily need to be shared. And an honest answer is sometimes people do things that we don't understand. Yeah. And if there's something that you're upset about, I would encourage you to discuss it. Well, no, I just get in trouble or I'm made to feel guilty. You know, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. That's a hard feeling. I'm here for you if you need a hug or if you want to talk about it. You know, those are ways to be honest, but deflect without seeming like, oh, that's grown up stuff. We don't talk about grown up stuff. I think that's a horrible answer for a child. Honestly, it makes them feel like they're insignificant and they don't matter. And there's a way to do it without sharing information with them as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I like that. I like to say one thing and then build off of that, build off of the questions that come from it or the lack of questions that come from it. Exactly. 
Yeah, because sometimes you're right. Like they just move on. They just move on to the next thing. And like this thing that was like, oh my God, how the hell will I answer this? It's like over in a second because they're like, oh, okay, that satisfies, check. You know, I, I got a real gem this past summer and, or no, actually, I think it was maybe two summers ago. And she said, mom, what's sex? Oh. And I paused for a second and I said, well, when you have a baby, you would, the doctor would say the sex of the baby is a girl or the sex of the baby is a boy. And she said, okay. And that was it. <laughs> oh, amazing. Was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. You were like, oh my God, like I have the star of motherhood today because I, well, I again, I answered it honestly. I didn't dismiss her. Oh, that's something you'll talk about when you're older. No. And similarly, we're taught to not stigmatize things because that's how kids are getting abused. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by making it something we can't talk about, but at the same time, I, I didn't want to talk about it. So I, yeah. you know, so I, you know, I gave an honest answer and, and that was enough for her at that age yeah. and time. And, and she accepted it. Right. There'll be another time when she's asking a more specific question um, and then you'll need, and she'll it. say, oh, mom didn't lie. You know, mom, yeah. she's not going to look back and say, why did mom lie to me? Right. Yeah. As we get into like the deep part of the story, this like really the really traumatic part there was something in one of your videos that you said that like got it like I mean your whole the whole video hit me but in this not teaching a kid to lie you said we teach kids to be honest and to speak about how they feel Mm -hmm. and like the impact that that will have on your daughter and that really tore me up because I think about my own and what that feels like it's something that it's hard for me to even think about because of The long-term damage this does, you know, she was assured there was another parent witness there and she was assured telling the truth, you know, she was so afraid if he found out it would be worse for her. And she's like, telling the truth is how we keep you safe. And what a lie that was. Um, And it's not to the parent's fault because we would have thought the same, you know, we're told if you see something, say something, you know, when that family in Dover, you know, was tragically murder, suicide, you know, all the lip service for domestic violence went up. But unfortunately, there is no help for you. And I believe that the police, you know, when they do something, they think they're helping. I believe when the clinician reported something, they think they're helping. Um, But then it goes into a system of there is no help for you. And I had a former lawyer that said to me, and this was the biggest concern, this was the biggest reason that I fired them is she said, you should find some help to basically make sure your daughter's not coming to you with these things anymore. Wow. And I was told by an attorney that the key to this was to get my daughter to stop talking to me about things that are happening to her. And let's just say we're not in divorce, we're not in probate court. But when your daughter goes to a party and something bad happens or when a teacher does something inappropriate or whatever, we are supposed to be training children to talk about it and to come forward so that we can protect them. And this person is telling me that I need to get her to silence herself for my court case. hmm yeah. And that's just wrong. And that was a huge reason. Um, and I, I actually like replaced that attorney immediately, but that was a huge problem. And as a parent, I don't care if you're in a divorce or not. I don't see how that wouldn't horrify you that children are taught. So my daughter asked for help and conveyed fear of retaliation and she got taken from her mother. My daughter conveyed help again and I lost the Zoom calls that I'm mandated by the court. Why will this child ever open her mouth again? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go into that piece. So you're with Judge Teixeira. The tone of the case starts to change. Things are starting to get reversed. Did you have the same attorney at this juncture? Is it the same attorney from the judge before Judge Teixeira and now? At this point, I had the same exact attorney up until I never was held a hearing for my first restraining order. And that was the same day that comment got said to me. And I had my same attorney, I'd say, until uh, November 6th. Okay. So until the winter, pretty much. So you went through all summer and very- sorry, October. But yes. And very- so much on that docket, I forget. But yes, until October. Yeah. And so the previous attorney starts to see- I'm guessing they're starting to see these things get reversed, these things get changed. What is their perspective on what's going on? So everything got changed immediately. It was like an immediate 100% reversal of orders. Though it wasn't written, there were things that were supposed to happen under the guidance of my daughter's therapist for her mental health that were not followed. You know, she even suggested that slow transitions are helpful. And he was insistent that this plan starts immediately by this date you know, the judge requires it. Well, I really don't think the judge would have held him accountable 
for phasing it over even a few weeks for her benefit based on what the therapist is telling you, right? But it was immediate that the girlfriend could come back. It was immediate that it goes to 50-50. So now you take a child with diagnosed adjustment disorder, right? And you throw them into a world that on top of it, I wasn't even prepared to tell her about because some of those things even happened before they were supposed to. And I wasn't even able to give her a heads up like, hey, you're going to see daddy. She might be there this weekend, you know, just because that's all the therapists say is that things can't blindside her. She has this Real, disorder. Just realistic expectations. Yeah. 100%. And so it started tumultuous. It continued tumultuous. And my attorneys were saying document, 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 document. So we were documenting the injuries. We were documenting, you know, my son starting to pee himself again. You know, my son had been dry for a long time through Airbnbs, through hotels, through weekend trips, you know, even places he's not familiar with. He can find a bathroom just fine. And now he's wetting himself. He's not able to sleep alone anymore. Yeah. You know, lots of things going on. Document, 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 document. Yeah. And you're documenting and they're suggesting you don't file, right? Correct. They said that they wanted it to stack up. Okay. And I don't know if that's because, I don't know. What is it because they're aware that this judge has issues? Is it because they're aware that something is going on? It wasn't made clear to me sometimes why they told me to do things. I remember when my son was first injured and they said to me, his school was like, you need to contact DCF. Like, like that's, you need to call them immediately. And my lawyer was like, you can't call DCF. But it was never made clear to me why. They didn't say, because this is what his side will use against you. Yeah. It was never conveyed to me why. And a friend of mine, who I you know, won't name names, who you may or may not know, had an instance where the school uh, raised concerns about their son and, and the father. And you know, she responded in a, I think, a 100% appropriate way. And she said, if you're having these concerns, you, know, you should do something about that. And what ultimately ended up going was mother asked us to call and DCF will say that is, quote, potentially manipulative. It doesn't mean it's manipulative, mm -hmm. but that's what it gets classified as when it comes from a parent. And that's what the other side's attorney will try to destroy you on, regardless yeah. of what happened. Yeah. And it also sounds like they're like, let's get enough. Your attorney was like, let's get enough evidence, like to basically when we go into court, like it's like we have all this evidence, but in that time happening. And you're like, kind of, it almost probably feels like I'm just like, you know, I'm walking through the twilight zone and I 100% file anything because I'm told I need more evidence. But like, is the evidence my kid getting into like a DUI? Is that enough evidence for the court? To I, I always felt that no one is going to care until my daughter's in the hospital. Yeah. And I thought that day happened. And then that was a direct catalyst to me losing them fully. Yeah. And so you do talk about this in detail on one of your TikTok video or two of your TikTok videos on one mom's battle that I will post in the show notes for anybody that wants to follow it. But you basically, you share there that at the end of December, your daughter was making some claims and you, I think you basically canceled one day of parenting time or something like that happened. So yes and no. Okay. Um, and again, here's to my detriment. I do not lie. So to my own fault, like there was somebody recently was like, oh my God, did he ever even change a diaper? And I was like, absolutely he did. I'm not going to sit here and yeah, slam. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I am, I will be able to stand behind what I say 100% and I will be able to provide receipts. So with her, she has this extreme episode, right? And she also discloses that she was hurt and that she's afraid that if it gets found out, she'll be hurt more his parenting time was suspended right away by the same judge. We go back into court a week later. Now, the only difference here is that I'm required to file a police report. Like that's what they want you to do. You have to file a police report if an incident happens or they'll just say it never happened. You have to, like, no matter what you do, you have to file a police report. So I went, I had to go file a police report in the town that it happened. And at this point, DCF was involved and they had let me know of two different aspects of red flags that had been raised that they were to investigate. And I panicked because I was aware of the statistics that when, you know, parental alienation has been claimed, when abuse comes up, that's, you know, mothers are way more likely to lose custody. And when other concerns of abuse are raised, they're almost never believed. And so I was panicked because when I went in on the 11th, that was only physical. And like that stands alone. I don't need more. I don't need other forms of potential abuse 
to go in on because I've always only stood on physical concerns, right? Mm -hmm. So now DCF is involved. I'm hysterical. The detective there finds me hysterical and and I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm going to get in trouble. He's like, no, 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 no. Like, just tell me why you're here. So I was like, I'm here for a police report, but I'm going to get in so much trouble. Like I was genuinely in fear. Yeah. And he, long story short, he was like, I believe like you need a restraining order immediately. And I said, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm going to get in trouble. And he's like, that's not how the law works. That's not how this works. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, he said, I am filing a report with, I'm filing a 51A. My advice to you is this. So now do I do it out of fear of getting in trouble or do I not do it and potentially get found negligent for not following his advice? The toughest position, right? And when you heard you say that on the video, I asked myself, like, what would I do? Well, the judge told me I should have stood up and walked out. <gasps> and that is on transcript. Yeah. She told me I should have stood up and walked out. Wow. Anyway. (laughs) And why? Like, is there a why on the transcript? No, no, there's no why. Because I should have just got up and walked out. Or I could have, could or should. To be quite honest, I'm not going to stand behind that exact word. It was either could or should. Yes. uh, But the direction was I could have just left. And then what happened? And then, you know, what would have been thrown in my face? Well, if she was concerned, she would have done something. I mean, which goes back to like, all of this documentation that you're doing and sort of waiting to see like what what point will it be enough and like things I'm sure escalate and like you obviously can't speak to the other parent about issues that are happening and so it brings you to this point of right of like well like at what point do I have to do something like at what point is it no more is it no longer like a maybe but it's a right so parenting time goes from suspended to now I'm in trouble verbally for getting for them issuing a restraining order and she says that if we don't sign a stipulation in 10 minutes, the kids are going into foster care. What? Yes. Not to like, first of all, like not like there's foster care in 10 minutes. Foster Again, care. transcript available. I mean, not that this needs to go down, that they need to be taken away from you. But well, also care. I'm confused. Yeah. The allegations were that were against him. I'm confused there. I'm confused now. Right. There aren't abuse and neglect allegations against you. Why can't you parent your own kids? Because you can't agree with somebody who's abusing them? Because maybe I'm making them say these things. And, you know, and then the clinician, the this, the that, you know, and my daughter must be Meryl Streep. And I am too, because we're just the best actresses in the world that have fooled, you know, people that do this professionally, right? Yeah. Versus a lawyer that's never being fact-checked. It's never producing any evidence. So we must be Meryl Streep. And I don't know, whatever, you know, insert real Dakota Fanning when she was, or whatever child actress was really great at a young age. And I would tell you, we would be making a lot more money in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this would be like a nightmare of a story that we would never want to watch. And Um, there's this, you know, that thing, Occam's Razor. It's like, typically the answer is the most obvious. It's not this elaborate, plot of these elaborate things and it's like you're kind of creating these elaborate stories when like the truth is right in front of your face so we sign the stipulation under extreme duress what's the stipulation for that now they spend one week with me and now they spend a whole weekend with him and they go out of state okay where his parenting time had just been suspended for all of these things that are you know anyway so we don't know what to do. At that point, I contact my senator. At that point, I can't, well, I mean, things happened in the interim. We had to meet with the DA in Woburn. The detective came out and was like, you were right. And I'm like crying, you know, you know, they're all like, we've never heard of this. You know, the DA pulled the thing and she's like, this doesn't even make sense. The DA even quoted the stipulation as quote, not even enforceable. So this, I mean, everyone is like, this is insane, right? So I'm seeing this as insanity. Everybody's backing this as insanity. I reach out to my state rep and my senator and I tell my lawyer that and they withdraw with that as a reason. Yeah. So from there, we're floating or like we're, you know, in the water without a lifeboat. And what I did try to sell was, oh, you're going to have so much fun. You're going to have these presents. And I'm selling this like my life depends on it because I'm afraid. I'm terrified. I mean, whatever I was terrified of this judge before, now I'm in extreme fear. So I'm selling the ability for them to go on this, this weekend like my life depends on it, right? And then they get RSV and my son is sick with 103 degree fever and even has to be seen at Boston Medical Center on the 24th. Mm -hmm. 
they both get very ill and I'm photographing thermometers because he's going to say I'm lying. He, yeah. There's a confirmed RSV diagnosis from the doctor. Now, at this point, my son, one of the things that happened to my son is he fought for his life to not be taken by his father. And it was a physical altercation. And my son screamed in ways I have never heard in my life. And my son is loud. Everyone will tell you my son is loud in a temper tantrum. This was an un ungodly scenario. His sister was like hitting, you know, hitting to get him to stop. I ended up even having like losing my footing and like doubling back and she caught me. I ended up in the emergency room that night for an aggravated neck injury. Although I was not the intent of what happened, it was targeted at my son. And this is on surveillance footage. This is actually what resulted in the first two restraining orders being ordered in the probate court. So I've spent an hour and a half at a fire station in North Reading. I have been at the pediatrician's office when my son's sick and he screamed in the lobby to not leave with his father. So now I'm under stipulation where a random third party is supposed to take the children with RSV out of my home on Christmas Eve mm -hmm. and bring them to another random third party to bring them to him. And how is that supposed to go? Like these kids are very ill, very, very, very ill. And an exacerbation of, you know, that, I don't even know what that would have done to my son. I don't even know, you know, what, I mean, his oxygen levels were having to be monitored. His blood pressure was raised by his fever. What would a fight for his life even looked like at that point? Yeah. Yeah. So I notified him that we had filed an appeal, which I, again, I didn't know what I was doing, but I filed something to kind of like go back to the day of the 18th. And so I'm told that that stays on what happened and that until we go back, you know, the children, you know, they have RSV. I can't send them. Let's get together and discuss how we might put something together so that the children, you know, so that this can move forward. Mm -hmm. So you so, out and say, look, they're super sick. Like, yes. like insanely sick, you know, if they were I do mention their mental state. I do mention that that is exacerbated. I do mention that as well. Yeah. Because I was faulted for that, that I claimed it was because they were sick. Yet I also mentioned, and I testified in my affidavit I submitted, mentioned both. So I never lied. It's right there in the affidavit. Yeah. Well, yeah. But I was faulted for that because I didn't just mention sick. But then at the same time, she also said she didn't care if they were sick. So, I mean, none of these things make sense to me, but I was, so I, in, in their defense, I, I mean, whatever that defense is, I did mention that they were very ill and that the emotional state was also poor. Yeah. And those two feed each other, right? When we're sick, we don't, we don't, our emotional state is down. When we're down, we get sicker. You know, it's, they, they feed, those feed each other. And it sounds like you also tr are trying in this moment to take what we would see on the outside as like a reasonable approach of like, this weekend's not going to work, but let's figure something out. Outside and of work. That was never part of the parenting plan, period. And that's the challenge. So not only is there an issue, not only was it part, not part of the parenting plan, not only are they really sick, like there was nothing really stacking up that any of this was in the best interest of the child. And to be honest with you, I was never even faulted for that in writing. It was never part of her facts and findings of why she took them from me. He never even filed contempt about it, you know, and another judge, the main judge in Suffolk County even said that he said, you know, you solutionized this problem. That was up to him if you wanted to file for contempt, because that's how the law works or it's supposed to. Yeah. If I did that, he was supposed to file contempt if he felt it was contempt of the order. And right. he never even filed that. How did he respond when you said like they're sick, they're not going to be able to come? I'm not sure. I want to say he wasn't, he kind of fought with me a little bit. I always kept my responses very like, if a judge reads this, this would be reasonable. Um, or, you know, so I would have thought. And we, he ultimately said, okay, I'll do a Zoom. And I said, do you mean with me? Because I had offered to Zoom with him to kind of try to find a path forward. And he was like, nope, with the children. So he Zoomed with the children. And then we didn't know what would happen when he would come back from out of state. You know, is he then going to say, okay, it's my weekend. I'm seeing the kids. Yeah. You know, we, we hadn't addressed what that would be. It was just right then they were too sick to like leave the state. Yeah. And we never heard from him again, which I can't say why we didn't, but I would assume it's part of his argument that they were withheld this entire time. We never heard from him again. He never said, I'm back from, you know, Connecticut. I'd like to see the kids. That was never communicated either. Or how are the kids feeling? Never. How are they feeling? Are they feeling better? Like I would keep him posted every time. So if somebody went into the hospital I kept him posted if when my daughter got ill, I kept him, I did keep him updated 
again, to be quite honest, not because of me, because I never get a good response from that, but to even illustrate or to follow the rules of court and what you're supposed to do as a co-parent. Because I know in my heart, no one's hearing that on the other side, but I still have to do it to play the game and play by the rules. And so I even still did that. Yeah. Is the appeal what brings you back into court? No, the appeal was rejected because I had, quote, hybrid representation. I had a lawyer at that time, um, but I didn't. So they were denied it for hybrid representation. And then there was another one where they were like, you need to file a motion in probate court. So, you know, there's a lot of like nuanced things of like passing the buck, if that makes sense. Yeah, not here, go here. Oh, this is missing this period on this, you know, dot, please go here, that kind of stuff. I will say, though they haven't been helpful, it's much more organized. You know, the clerks, everything at appeals court and -hmm. superior is way more organized. Somebody answers the phone, files are found, they can pull information quickly, they are polite, they're professional. When they receive e-filings, they handle them, even if they're not 100% perfect. Because even in in probate, even if they are 100% perfect, they may reject them three times because I don't know why. I have nothing but at least at that respect, I will say those were functioning at a much more professional system that I would have expected from court. Yeah. So what brings you back into court on the 4th? So we were due in court on the 2nd, actually, and everybody showed up and my case was mysteriously gone from the docket and the judge was not there. Hey, Wow. So there's a squabble over who has the children. And the worst thing that I heard from his attorney, I reported this in my affidavit. So this is public record. And I don't know why I should be afraid to say it anyway, as he yelled. So if the judge isn't here, she wins. And I looked right at him and I said, this is not about winning or losing. This is what's best for the children. That's literally it. That is like nothing gets me more triggered than using the word winning when talking about family law cases. He said it. Like, I mean, we weren't in the courtroom. He said it even in front of the court clerk. Like, so she wins? Like, whoa. You know, and and yes, I know, you know, he obviously when he makes up these fake lies or when he admits in open court that his motion was a lie, which, oh, by the way, is a violation of the law. Like, you can't do that when an attorney signs their name on something. They have to say it's accurate to the best of their knowledge. So when they get up in court and say in opening statement, oh, that was actually all a mistake. That's actually an explicit violation of the law, but I digress. So I, there was a squabble over who was supposed to have the kids. I ran down to the clerk's office and tried to file something to get in front of a judge to get guidance on what happens now. Because right now we're all floating in the middle of the ocean with no guidance. And I'm still expecting protection from the court. So I get in front of Judge Dunn, who was actually the judge that had issued my restraining orders in September. And he, you know, again, I've, I've always thought this man is going to be so annoyed by me because I had to go in front of him twice due to a filing error. At this point, they had to unlock the courtroom door because they assumed they were done for the day. It was like 10 minutes to closing. And the, he had to be called back in and like put on his outfit. Like I was like, this man is going to hate me. Like I'm set up for failure right now. And I have to admit, I've never felt him to be the warmest person. But what I've seen from him is I've seen him do his job. I've sat there and heard him make calls to check in on, you know, verifying stories. Like, I, I again, I, I can't speak for him one way or another. I have experienced him do his job. And he said to me right there, I said, I don't know what to do, blah, 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 blah. And he said, I will schedule a court date for you two days from now on the 4th. That's when he said, you solutionized the problem. That was up to him to file for contempt. I was like, well, what do I do? He's like, I can't give you legal advice. And I said, I understand that. But as a person of the court, he was like, that's basically my way of saying like, you don't know, you figure it out. So, which was also interesting because he wasn't telling me to do something that my husband was saying either. So yeah. I went into court on the fourth. Um, well, on the third, my daughter reports being forced to take photos that made her feel uncomfortable. And I just, I, I find this story very interesting for anybody else that might experience this is she complained to me on the third of these really uncomfortable photos. And she said, it almost made me feel like he wants me to seem happy. Mm. And she described the photos in detail. So I actually reached out to him, not because, you know, he's going to care what I say. I mean, part of it was to document, but I was like, hi, you know, she's saying this. I'm not sure why she would say this, but I just want to let you know she's stating she's uncomfortable. I also add it to my affidavit. Wouldn't you know, he produces the same exact photos. I must've been a mind reader. But anyway, so I prepare a 12 page affidavit and I walk in with 27 pieces of evidence and I have this times three. I have one to file with the court. I have one for myself and I have one hand to his attorney because at this point I will be pro se. 
Yeah. And I am like, I have photographs of injuries. I have police reports. I have medical reports. I have letters from the school showing that once the order changed in May, she started going to the counselor's office again. I have the attendance record showing some of her panic attacks around not wanting to go during his visits. Like you name it, I've got it. You know, the only thing I don't have at this point is the medical report from the crisis counselor, but I have the name of the crisis counselor. You can call her. I have the name of these people. Like, this is what happened. And if you don't believe me, please give her a call. You know, I have everything. And I go in and it was not that long. And she basically said that she was stripping me of full physical and legal custody. I would have Zooms three days, three times a week with my children. And I dropped them off for school and I never picked them up again. That day? That day. Wow. And there was a witness there that she kicked everyone. There were two people there. She kicked them out. But I mean, they told me they were like listening behind the door for a lot of it. But when it got bad and when it took a break, did a break for lunch, I I said something and she would get a challenge. Like I was like, I filed an appeal. You can't do that. She's like, I'll have to go check, you know, so she'd go check. And then I would say something else and she would have to go check. So, I mean, I was speaking to a colleague that was there for something she does professionally with a DCF case. You know, she was there not for her own situation, but as a, you know, she had to be in the court in representation in some form for some trial that's in DCF. And she was like, there's no way, like, this is not, this isn't a law work, blah, 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 blah. So though she was kicked out of the court, the door was still open or she wasn't kicked out again. Like the door was open at this point when she finally gave the order. And what she did was she sent somebody out to him with a notepad to write something down. And I noticed that she didn't come out to send something for me. And I just knew it was something strange. So she came out, she read the order, this witness, which again, it's, it's, I have the transcript. I took it like a champ. I made a, I said, can you please verify that this is being recorded? She said, yes, it's being recorded. I made a statement and I said, thank you. I will figure out what I need to do next. And I walked out of there. I did not cry. I did not shout. I mean, I lost it later, but I took it the best way. I thought the way you need like, survival mode, the way I think I should have, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, the human aspect would have been to burst into tears to be like, how oh, can you do that? You know, and our, but like that wasn't going to do anything. And that wasn't going to show my strength and my determination that I won't, that this is far from over. And that person did, she was one of the earlier comments on my Mm -hmm. social media, you know, while I was still being quiet, I think I was just saying, you know, I lost my kids. Like I don't see them. And she was like, I was there, you know, when this mom, you know, started pointing out some mistakes and she kicked us out of the room and she spoke, you know, this, and she was met with basically stating how I was spoken to very inappropriately and this, that, and the other. So yeah, I would say up until yesterday, I never saw the children after that again. I never even got to say goodbye. Yeah. yeah. How could anybody, anybody, drug addicts have their children? I mean, people in alcohol rehabilitation programs have children. I mean, people out there that aren't in probate cases, you know, are actively doing horrendous things to their children. There's no even big claim against me. How could anybody think that not even saying, in other words, not even saying like, okay, starting Friday, he's going to have an extended. How could anybody think that that is even in an atmosphere of what's best for a child? And like, again, no neglect, no abuse, no claim. No. The claim was that I've interfered with him and that they need to quote, reconnect. Um, the claim was also, I think, again, I can't say for certain it's possible because she did say at the end, I don't have time to review everything which was kind of concerning. And there were things like, I don't remember things. So that was a little concerning. But in the facts and findings, which you're required to do when you change temporary custody, you're required. I don't know if people know this, you're required to do facts and findings because you're actually not allowed to just change custody for temporary orders. Otherwise kids could be yo-yoing left and right. Um, But if it's saying that harm might come to the children, if I don't issue this, That's when you change temporary orders before a judgment comes out. And so you're required to do facts and findings. So her facts and findings, which are not facts nor findings, was her opinion that I interviewed with the children. This was issued sua sponte, which means on her own. It wasn't even a motion. It was my motion. It wasn't even his motion to take the kids from me. And that I had applied for a restraining order on September 28th and it was denied, except I have them in hand. So that's not correct. And then I applied for another one on December 11th and it was denied. Oh yes, that's the one that you denied when you said my kids are going to foster care, but that doesn't, you know what I mean? But I think she, I mean, my people thought that maybe she was writing that to make me look like, 
you know, like if she tries to go for another restraining order, she's going to look like this crazy person that just keeps trying. I can't say why she did or didn't do that. It could have just been she didn't remember or have time to review everything. But a lot of people have felt that that's why it was there, except, and that was the first documentation that I produced was the restraining orders because not only do I have them, but they were issued in the same courthouse. Yeah. They weren't even issued in a district court. They were issued in the probate court. Right. So they, when she pulled up your case and your name. They're right there. Yeah. Nobody even ever said they didn't exist. So I don't, she was the one that vacated them. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, like I, I, I couldn't wrap my brain around it. And I can't as say as to why. I don't know as to why, you know, people have their opinions. Sometimes even go back and forth on my opinion because she had suspended his parenting time in the 11th. The only difference is after that is his attorney was present. Is there something going on with his attorney? Yeah. Is there some bias towards that? Do they have some deal going on? Because his attorney wasn't present when she suspended his parenting time. And every single thing I said in that, you know, she said, well, I suspended his time because you claimed this type of abuse. But the transcript will show that never came up at all. It only came up on the 18th because DCF was investigating it. Right. So none of that was stated on the 11th and there's records and proof. Yeah. So it's, I think it's challenging for that. I think that's why maybe it's garnished so much attention because there's significant flaws. You know, I was reviewing a friend's case, you know, not that I'm an expert or I know anything, but I was, you know, and and it's, it's a lot messier than mine. Yeah. You speak the same language. There's, there's clear cut things in mind, like saying that orders on the 28th never happened that do, you know, saying things like that or. My case is, I think, crazy to the 10th degree. And, you know, where you say, I know three people with similar stories, you know, some of the people I have met, one of the 17-year-olds ran away back to the mother. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason she's there. And that mother has a transcript. Again, I've seen part of the transcript. I've never reviewed her case, but she said she didn't care until the child's 18. She's on the child's under her control. And people are horrified just say, well, people are like, no, 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 judges don't force back 17 year olds. Well, mine does. And I don't know whoever, however many other judges do, but 17 year olds are being forced back. You know, another one said, if I'm forced back, I'm going to kill myself. He was abusing a 17 year old. This he's saying is this person was abusing him for four years. That's not credible. And the answer is, well, he deserves a chance to make it right. That the abuser deserves a chance to make it right. Oh my God. Yeah. And I'm deeply terrified mm-hmm. for my children for that reason. Even if, let's just pretend that there's three sides to a story, right? My interpretation of things that have been sedated as abuse might not be somebody else's interpretation. Well, let's just go there, right? Let's just, let's just suspend that for a moment. There is no way what is happening now is not abuse. Mm-hmm. My children are screaming for me. My son had to be taken out screaming and hitting his father, begging to see me. Is this why this, this is suspended? torturous abuse? This is inhuman. This is like civil rights violations. There is nothing now that this is not like torture of children and extremely detrimental to their mental state, causing irreparable damage. This is trauma. They went to school one day thinking they were going to see their mom. Correct. And it's almost worse in a way than if kids go to school and mom's in a tragic car accident and dies, because at least there's some closure, you know, you're, you're, it's never, you're never going to get over that. I mean, what's, what's like better in the other my, side of a computer? Like you're on the other side of a Zoom call. It, it's, it's torture. It's not just grief. It's also torture. And seeing the picture of my son suck his thumb. I didn't even register it at first. Like I, I was like, what is he doing? I was like, is he, oh my God, he, he literally in and out. He was sucking his thumb in my arms. Yeah. It hurts me to say that because to visualize, to remember that from yesterday, I, yeah. He's five. He hasn't sucked his thumb since he was an infant. He wasn't even sucking his thumb as a two-year-old. Yeah, it's yeah, it's that regression. I mean, similar to the wetting the bed and not being able to sleep. Like it's it's all of these like regressions that are caused by trauma. That and it's so it's so it's so sad. Were you able to see them yesterday? I was. My daughter had a performance at her school that she had asked me to attend on one of the Zooms before the Zooms got canceled. And, you know, for asterisk, the Zooms weren't canceled by the court. The Zooms were canceled, yeah, from retaliation for personal grievances. But uh, yeah, and I mean, you walked into the school and the parents were like, hey, are you around this weekend? You want to get the kids together? Yeah. They they don't know what's going on. I mean, my friend, 
my son's school and my daughter's school are different. You know, my son's school is a very tight community. Like we hang out on the weekends. We go to, you know, I was supposed to take a party bus with all the other moms to go see one of them perform. She's a singer. You know, Mm -hmm. obviously I wasn't able to attend that, but like we're close at that school. Like they all know what's going on. Like they all know me as the parent. So they're up in arms over it. But my daughter's school, like they're not aware of this stuff and they're not on like TikTok, you know, like they're not dealing with this stuff. So, you know, they don't know. So, I mean, it was also odd to walk in and have people be like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, I don't want to say terrible because I'm gonna have to get into it. You know, so, you know, I got a hug from the parents that know, which is like a couple of them. And yeah, I didn't realize my son would be there. So I was thrilled to see my son because my son really needs it. My son is a fighter. And I hear that my son is actively still fighting and crying and screaming for me, that he hasn't even gone into like self-preservation mode in that. Yeah. Which, I mean, he hit him, he was kicking, he was screaming. And then I had to give him kind of to my aunt. He had to, you know, be kind of gra- like, you know, clawed off me from my aunt to hand him yeah. to his dad because, you know, we weren't going to snatch him. I mean, but that's the thing. Like, he's like, you can't go home with mom. Well, why can't he? All he has to do is say it's okay. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, like, he's not required by court to not allow me, you know, just like when he had alternating weekends and he wanted to take a, you know, or wanted to do something or wanted to take her to a concert on a Thursday night. That was my night. I wasn't like, well, I'm not allowed to do that. Of course, right. his phone number was always programmed into my daughter's child phone or on her gizmo watch. Like she could call him anytime she wants. Right. Yeah. I, I have never said, I want to see dad be like, well, you can't. Like I have never, ever, ever in my life said that. I've invited him to my home for Halloweens so that we could trick or treat together. I mean, I didn't want to but I did it for the kids. Right. He's been right. to my home for all the birthday parties. We take photographs together on the first day of school. I have always presented a like, let's get together with your father attitude. Whereas yeah. this Halloween, it was his parenting time. Do you think I was invited? Yeah. And I don't even care, but don't make it like I'm the one pushing right. you away from the children when you've been in my house two years in a row for Halloween. Right. And like you said, like there's no order that says that you are not allowed to see the children. He could say- You can end this at any time. Like we could come together. He could say, you know, this is all getting out of hand. Right. The, the, the children kids. clearly need their mother. Yeah. But let's, you know, let's figure this out. I mean, anybody can say that at any moment. So witnessing, you know, children standing there screaming for their mother, you know, on a Zoom call or on the Zoom call, somebody stating that their bad feelings are getting worse and they told their father that, you know, I don't understand who, where, why, when, I don't understand how anybody would allow this. Yeah. Is he still with that girlfriend? His fiance? Yeah, well, and the they, fiance- they are. I hear they're engaged. And um, the reason I know that is because he told me, but he told me because he shared it with the children, which set my daughter off again. And that was right before Thanksgiving. And that was when a lot of her mental health issues returned. And some of the things that were really scary that she was kind of threatening or saying that is when it all returned. Which again, I mean, when this started, they don't like her for X reasons. But when this started, you know, the therapists were even like, even if they like her, it would cause very conflicting traumatic feelings because then they might feel guilt for liking her or this or that or whatever. It's like, that's where like, there's no benefit from an involved third party. There was no benefit. They might be a gem to your child. It doesn't matter. That gem to your child could cause guilt because that's not your mom or dad. Right. That causes deep things that kids can't understand and process. And then they're going to be with a therapist when they're 25. I just wonder how women not looking at this whole situation, like, dude, call their mother. Well, I mean, one of the injuries happened from her in May. The first injury happened when my son reported himself being shoved to the ground and given a bloody nose. Oh, My daughter learned about suicide from this individual because I guess her brother killed himself. And so she had this whole conversation with my daughter at six or seven years old. Wow. So I I don't, I used to think, and I've never met her. I've been stalked on the internet by her, but I've never met her. I certainly won't say her name, you know, because that's neither here nor there. But I used to think maybe she's like me. Maybe this was just, you know, she was 35. She was still single. You want to see what you want to believe. I just assumed it might be something like that. But there were reasons outside of an independent third party that led to her being vacating from the home. There were reasons and concerns that happened primarily with my daughter and the 251As that were filed from the pediatrician and from my daughter's therapist were actually about, were against her. Yeah. I don't understand how anybody can live in a house where children are screaming for their mother. 
I mean, it makes me sick thinking about it. I don't understand. Yeah. And if I'm thinking about it, like in my case, like if my daughter was like screaming to talk to her dad, I would give her the phone. That, I mean, again, and it might make me a little dead inside. You know, I mean, my son sometimes would be like, I miss dad. And in my head, I'm like, and I, again, this is just being honest, take it or leave it. And these are the things that, you know, could be misinterpreted in court. When my son sometimes would be like, oh, I miss dad. I mean, it was very rare that he said it. My daughter had more guilt. And in my head, I'd be like, you beg and plead to not go there. Like, what are you talking about? But I'm not going to say that. And I was like, oh, yeah, you didn't want to go to dad's yesterday. And he's like, well, no, I want to see dad, but with you. I don't want to be alone with him. Mm, yeah. And there's an innate, I mean, I testified in court that they love their father. Of course they do. I mean, adults that are like 30 years old that might've been violently abused by their parents are, you know, that might even be in drastic therapy. It's very hard to not love a parent. We're programmed that way. It's survival. We are made from our parents. So if our parent is bad, we are bad. Or, you know, that's a thought. That's a psychological thing. They do love their father. You know, it doesn't mean the, you know, one of my son's earliest statements, which was really profound, he said, I love daddy, but I don't like him. Yeah, yeah. And I, I testified in court. They love their dad. He is their dad. Better or worse, he's always going to be their dad. I just want to ensure that it is safe, that the hospital program or whatever was recommended starts, that we get a GAL in here, that we figure out what's going on, and we move forward. Yeah. That's all I asked. And that right, also got used against me. Let's figure it out. And bring testified. In. They like their father. They love their father. Yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> and I'm, does that make me a bad person? <laughs> no. And like, I think, I mean, like I'd say the same thing. I know my child loves her dad. You know, of course there's like things that she's issue with, but at the end of the day, you're telling the truth. You're also in what you said, you're not saying let's restrict his parenting time. You said, let's figure this out. Let's take the proper steps and let's make it safe and consistent. I've said, like, let's temporarily maybe pause when something scary happened. You know, right. let's get these steps in motion and that's, let's see where we are. Right. Kind of goes back to the Katie Rice plan of like, let's have a step up program. Like, you know, let's get a GAL, let's get these things, let's get a plan going so that we have a workable plan. Right. And I mean, the thing that for all those like junk science, like parental alienation claims, I mean, a friend of mine that was having issues with the father that has substance issues and had to be put on pause for substance she still reached out and said, hi, we're going to the park. Do you want to come to the park with us? Yeah. She still made efforts Yeah, for the children to see their dad. I mean, she has a picture of the dad taped up. You know, I, I, I've i seen it, you know, in the house. It, it's just, she made efforts. You know, he would always turn them down. But hey, we're going to the playground. Like, do you want to come with us so that you can have the time? You know, obviously there, it was paused for safety concerns, but so the children can see you. Yeah, yeah. Being forcibly cut off from them in all ways. I mean, this is all like actual parental alienation, which is, you know, the most ironic thing here. Opposed by the judge that's there and backed up by their father. Well, I mean, yeah, or you could say like that was the attack of the father and supported by the judge is kind of how I see it. He filed to suspend my parenting time on November 6th. And that was the one where his lawyer stood up and said, once there was a witness, Oh, that didn't happen. My paralegal wrote it wrong. Oh Sorry, God. that's not the law. Like you, when right. you sign something, you are required to adhere to that. Yeah, and you are paid a lot of money to remake sure that those things are accurate. He got caught in the lie and he got caught in the frivolous motion. And guess what? The judge didn't punish him for it. He even admitted in opening statement. And then she let him go on to rant and rave about me. And then she said she should cancel my trip to Disney on my parenting time. Oh. Why? Yeah. <laughs> My daughter's ninth birthday present, which she's wanted for two years that I finally scrambled together and I'm taking solely on my parenting time, should be canceled. And the reason she's not canceling it is because it would make the dad look bad. That's why she graciously allowed me to keep taking it. What? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And, you know, advocates were like, I've always heard this, but we don't have proof. Oh, the transcripts have been paid for. You know what I mean? Like, I will never say a claim that I cannot back up in fact. Yeah. And that's why it probably is scary. Because I'm not just some crazy, you know, when he reached out to a family member, we're really concerned about our mental health. They were like, we stand behind Christine and the children 100% and we'll continue to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure everybody that is listening to this would be wondering, where does this go from here? Like, what are the next steps in your plan? You shared with me right before we got on that you do have an attorney now 
I do. So that's been sorted out. Somebody that is going to like, she is a criminal attorney first and a probate attorney second. Yeah. So is this in the appeal? I mean, no, this is still within the probate system. We're kind of giving this a shot within the system. Just we're going to give this a shot to have the wrongs righted, let's say, before we strategize on the other sides. However, there are other trains that have been in motion. You know, obviously, there was involvement from some government. The state auditor is well aware of what's going on. Or Healy's office had been indirectly connected to by somebody that knows both of us. You know, there's there's people that have been working on a documentary for this for nearly two years that are in their final stages of funding. I mean, this is, I think, something that is about to explode. And I hate that it didn't explode before this happened to me because I don't want to be in this position and I would give anything to not be. But as of now, we have a court date scheduled for February 9th. Whether that changes, that is currently what's in the docket. So I can't say anything plus or minus on that date. But I do know a lot of people that wanted to come out for that date, whether it was just in support or to bear witness. And I welcome anybody to come to that court date. I just want to make sure if anything changes that that change is communicated. Yeah. And for anybody listening, if you did want to go, so you could look up the public record of the docket to see if the date changes or follow Christina, which we'll get to eventually. I actually plan on going on the night. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, all this contingency from my high school that not for any bad reason. I just haven't spoken to um, in a while. It's like all up in arms over it. And they're like, we've been, we've, they've all been taught. I mean, like one of these things you hear about stories online, but then you don't hear about it. Like you hear about it, you read about it, you know, what happens, you see things happen, but to have it all happen to one person. And for them, I think it was the wrong person because I'm not going to lie a month ago, I would have thought, oh, she must've done something. Just clearly, there's clearly something very wrong there. But the problem with me is that I used to have a very public facing business. I was in the newspaper. I was in magazines. I mean, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. All that is a lifetime ago. You know, my life changed with children and things like that. But a lot of people know me for many years. And aside from that, a lot of people know me as a mom because we are so social and because we are so inclusive that, you know, have spent a lot of time with me, not once, not twice, like extensive time with me that can speak to me as a parent, that have spoken to me as a parent. And, and I think that is why when he says, nobody believes her, not the doctors, not the this, not the that. It's like, I don't know who doesn't except for like two of, you know, the flying monkeys of narcissism. But unfortunately, it's kind of the wrong person because I wasn't like a quote, nobody, like people at least knew me. And so that's why it's insane because they're like, not only, I mean, one of my friends who's a great mother, but she went through a terrible divorce. She's like, not only are you a great mother, but like, you're a better mother than me. There is no better. But she's like, you take your kids skiing, you take your kids hiking. I'm too overwhelmed to do that. There's no better. We all go through seasons. It's but it's just, yeah, it's different. It's parents. just different. Correct. Yeah. But, I mean, if anything, I mean, his family, I mean, his mother, I remember who, despite any problems, I remember saying on a holiday to extended family, like she's a great mother. And that blew me away because this woman wasn't always my biggest fan and wasn't always, you know, she could be at odds with her own son, things like that. But even she could see it, yeah. you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure now, I, I don't know how they would back up what they're doing, but even that was seen by somebody that innately did not like me. And so I think that's why it's so wild. Yeah, no, it, I think it's absolutely wild for a variety of reasons. But I think for me, when I hear about threads of this all day long throughout the week, and I have my own opinions around the court system. But I think that some of these more, I hate saying the word alienation because it's pseudoscience. Yeah. I actually just saw a college is having a course in the pseudoscience. I'm like, what the, what the hell? Um, but something, <laughs> one thing I will say is that, so I'm trained by Tina Swithin. I talked, I would say she's a bit of a mentor for me. Tina doesn't back up people and share their story unless they're very credible and I actually, like, I found you first because we're in the same Facebook group and I started to know your story. Other women I work with in high conflict divorce coaching have brought up what's happening to you, you know, in like the local realm, it's getting a lot of attention. And then I remember I went on to Tina's site and she did this whole thing, like map of the family court system. And she was talking about family, you. family court math. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it just sort of like, it continues to add up. And 
I was thinking about this too before we joined like this. I was like, I want you to get your children back. I want them to be safe. I want them to be thriving. I want you to be happy. I'm going to cry. I'm like, I want, I want everybody back where they're supposed to be. I wish you didn't have to be the person that is going to bring awareness to this in Boston. I think you're doing so much good work, but I really and truly wish that this didn't have to be you. I wish this didn't have I feel the exact same. I would rather the figurehead for this right now wasn't me. But if, you know, the sloppy work just got done to the wrong person and, you know, I mean, there's a few series of unfortunate events that created a perfect storm of this case. And I think that the documentary that I spoke to, which is funny, no podcast is part of it, but this is totally fine. I spoke to them about it. It would be like not a podcast series yeah, because I did sign an exclusivity with them. And I did that for a reason, but they've been working on this for two years because it happened to one of their friends and as reporters, they were like, what? And so they started looking into this. They uncovered all this, you know, this, that, and the other. And they were like, we've been looking for somebody like you. And wow, like in your two years, you've been looking for somebody like me because mine is just that effed up. Yeah. Well, I feel like like it's validating and it's horrific at the same time because these are lives at stake. Every day that goes by, my kids are further traumatized. I am further traumatized. I don't even know where we go from here. Mm-hmm. But they've been looking for somebody that, like, like me. Like the public just doesn't understand how common this is. Like looking for two years, they found you. I'm so glad they found you. But I hear about these stories. I'm sure you do. Like, I guess I haven't heard one like this <laughs> in a few months, but it wasn't that long ago. I mean, again, being in the one mom's battle community, I hear of about course. That a lot. but. Yeah, I'm glad they huge, huge plug to Tina. I mean, the work she does, I've gotten to know her personally. I mean, I don't know if you know, I might botch this up, Dr. Christine Cochiola. Yep, yeah, actually doing but, her training ne- next month. Yeah, she is a big supporter of me. She stays in touch with me. She has offered to come testify for me. And she said, I do not testify. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I shouldn't maybe put that out there, but it was just that egregious that she like can't, like almost like is following this until it stops with me specifically. But obviously these people do amazing work and I've been able to align with amazing people. This might not be accurate, but I'm, I think it's possible that Tina might be friends with Kelly Rutherford. And I, re- I recall when Kelly Rutherford went through her traumatic um, custody issue when her children were taken out of the country. Mm-hmm. And, you know, through degrees of separation, I've known Kelly Rutherford. I don't know if Kelly would or wouldn't remember me, but she and I used to hang out at the Mercedes Benz Fashion Week Lounge at New York City in Lincoln Park or when at Lincoln Center for Fashion Week in the VIP Lounge with the champagne. Like I knew Kelly from that, you know, so it's obviously that was a different life ago, but it, it is all these like degrees of separation and it happens to people that are even famous. So that with resources, like what chance do I stand? But here we are. Yeah. I hope that we can connect after this is because again, I'm hopeful that everybody returns back to like the kids come back and this takes a turn and it goes like where it was with the first judge. I mean, even now, I don't even know how we go back. You know what I mean? Like so much has happened that I don't even see how we could go back. How do they ever go back to somebody that basically held them against their will from their mother? You know, like if there weren't issues before, how do we go back from this? Right. What is the path forward? I don't even have that answer. Yeah. You know, like even if we reverted back to what we where we stood on, you know, whatever date, um, how are my kids? I mean, they didn't want to go before, you know what I mean? And now they've been fully traumatized. How do we heal from this? I don't have that answer. If somebody else has that answer, I welcome any resources. So I at least know what to do when that time happens. And all the advocacy, all the awareness, all the shares, all the comments, all the likes, all the people recording their own videos, being like, I know this woman, like, what the heck? Um, This isn't okay. You know, all of that is helpful. And people know people and people have connected me to different political people and people have connected me through conversation is how we've gotten this far. And the war isn't over. We have a lot left to do. And I am in need of everything and anything. Yeah. So on that, please share how people can find you. And just before we do that, I'll just say there's also a GoFundMe out for Christina and her legal bills, which are astronomical. Anybody that's been through family court knows how astronomical they are. Imagine how astronomical they will be in her case that we're talking multiple six digits. So I will post the link if you can, if you're able, please donate. 
And I, with that, every donation is helpful. Like Chris was like a nickel. I don't think you can actually donate a nickel, but that sentiment Dollar. is accurate. Yeah, yeah. Anything is helpful. And, and if you are unable, like, I understand I've been there. Even just sharing the story is helpful. So everybody doing what they can or are able to, you know, and some people can donate money, but they can't share the story because they're in their own battle and they're afraid. So, you know, like I said, everything and anything is an integral part of fixing this for me, but fixing this for us as well. Yeah. Can you share your handle on TikTok and Instagram? Yes, I am single mama magic. That's mama, M-A-M-A. My joke is there was a single dad magic. And when I changed my name for the life of the single mother, I was like, well, then I'm the single mama magic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so and I'm very new to TikTok. I don't, I didn't know anything about TikTok before, but once Tina was posting things, you know, we kind of jumped on the train, but it is the same handle in both. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. I'm sorry that this is the circumstance that we're talking, but. I well, thank you for having me. But most importantly, thank you for having this platform because I said it once, I won't stop saying it. I might say it less eloquently at times, but like evil exists in the dark and the shadows. And I do believe it cannot exist in the light. And that is why like the movie Spotlight and the Spotlight team at the Globe, like that term spotlight, like if we put the light on it, I don't see how it can survive. So I think that we all need to shed as much light on this as possible. And I think that's our responsibility yeah. and our obligation as members of this government that the people should not be afraid of their government. Yeah. And we do not want to teach kids to grow up scared to speak about what's actually happening. Right. And if not me, you, I mean, I'm just the person this happened to, but this happens all the time. Right. Well, thank you so much, Christina. I know we spent a lot of time together today, but I really, really appreciate you coming on, you sharing your story. I know this will help people that are feeling very stuck. And I hope that this also leads to some extra resources that will help you. It like that woman that unfortunately led to assisted suicide. She said, I hope this isn't for nothing, that this sheds awareness. My children will come home, but I hope, you know, don't let this trauma be for nothing. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. Um, thank you. Be in touch. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.